Today I want to share with you how to make lard the right way. It's basically learning how to render pork fat, but there are a couple of important tips that you need to know so that your lard comes out perfect every time. Hi sweet friends, I'm Mary and welcome to Mary's Nest where I teach traditional cooking skills for making nutrient-dense foods like bone broth, ferment, sourdough, and more. So if you enjoy learning about those things, consider subscribing to my channel. And don't forget to click on the little notification bell below. That'll let you know every time I upload a new video. Now, first things first, I want to take a few minutes to talk to beginners who are new to rendering animal fat. But if you just want to jump ahead and start making lard, be sure to open the description underneath this video where I'll have timestamps about everything that I'm going to cover so you can go ahead and jump right in. If you're new to rendering animal fat, there are a number of ways that you can do this. In two previous videos, I showed you a stovetop method where we rendered chicken fat to make schmaltz, and then I showed you how to render beef fat, or what's known as suet, to make tallow, and we did that in a Dutch oven in the oven. Now I'll be sure to link to those videos in the iCards above and in the description below so that you can learn how to make schmaltz and also learn how to make tallow. Now I want to just take a minute to talk about rendering suet to make tallow because the process can also be very similar if you take pork fat to make lard. Now the method that I showed you for making tallow was simply by chopping up your suet and putting it into a Dutch oven and then letting it all render at 225 degrees Fahrenheit in your oven for about five or six hours. Now you can certainly do that with your pork fat as well. And when you're all done rendering your suet or your pork fat, then you need to strain out all the little crispy bits or cracklins. So I've shared with you the stovetop method, and then I've shared with you the Dutch oven method that I just explained. And today I want to show you a third method for rendering animal fat. Now what this third method involves is making sure that you have some sort of nice big pot. What I've got here is a stock pot, but you can also use a Dutch oven if you have a nice big one. Next, you're going to need some sort of mesh strainer or some type of colander. I'm going to use my colander because it has handles, because we need to place this over our stock pot or our deep Dutch oven. But if you have a mesh strainer with a handle, you can certainly use that as well. What is important to remember is that whatever type of device you use, whether a colander or a mesh strainer, and what type of pot you use, you want to make sure that the colander or the mesh strainer is not touching any of the fat that's going to render down into your pot. So basically, you just want to make sure that you have enough room between the bottom of your colander or the bottom of your mesh strainer and the bottom of your pot. Generally, I like to render five pounds of animal fat, whether I'm doing suet or pork fat at one time. And so I find a nice big stock pot works well because I'm probably going to see about three inches or so of the rendered fat. So I like to make sure that my colander or my strainer has at least three inches or is at least three inches above the bottom of my pot. If you're rendering less fat, obviously you need less space. And if you're rendering more fat, you're going to want more space. But generally I find that five pounds is a good uh, amount to start with because this is going to take about six or so hours and it will render about three inches of the liquid fat. So that's some good measurement for you to know about. Now, let's just take a minute to talk about why do we want to render pork fat to make lard? Lard was maligned for years. Whenever you said, oh yes, I'm going to cook with lard, people would say, lard? Are you kidding? That's so bad for you. But in recent years, lard has been vindicated. Lard is actually extremely high in vitamin D. Obviously, getting sunshine is your best source for vitamin D. 
but second to that is lard. And what's interesting is why do we want to make sure we have a lot of vitamin D in our diet? It's because scientists have found that many people here in the United States and maybe in other parts of the world as well are deficient in vitamin D. And what happens when we're deficient in vitamin D? Scientists have found that people who are very deficient in vitamin D tend to be more inclined to develop cancer. So if we can up our vitamin D, all the better. And scientists have also found that getting natural sources of vitamin D, whether from the sun or from foods high in vitamin D, are always our best source of vitamin D as opposed to taking supplements. Second, lard also contains a nutrient known as choline. And choline is especially good for the brain and the liver. And scientists are studying choline thinking that possibly people with higher levels of choline may be less inclined to develop Alzheimer's disease. So that's some very interesting research that will be worth watching. Now I also want to mention that I will have a corresponding blog post that will accompany this video and I'll be sure to link to that in the description below and in that blog post I'll discuss all of these benefits of lard and also provide for you the scientific links if you're interested in learning more about that. Another benefit, speaking of choline, is that it's very good for the liver. It helps apparently clean out some of the toxins, so to speak, that can develop in our liver. So two good reasons to make sure that we do have sufficient choline in our diet. Lard also has a very good smoke point. Its smoke point, which means the temperature to which you can heat the lard before it is damaged, is 375 degrees Fahrenheit, which I believe is 190 degrees Celsius. So lard is excellent for sautéing or pan frying. Another benefit of lard, and I think you're going to find this exceptionally interesting and maybe even surprising, but lard is actually high in monosaturated fats. Now what else is high in monosaturated fats? Olive oil. And I think we've all heard how great olive oil is for us, for our skin, our hair, our hearts, our, just our bodies overall. Olive oil contains 77% of monosaturated fats, but lard contains 48% of monosaturated fats. So it's really up there in terms of being a fat that is high in monosaturates. And scientists have found that when we have a diet rich in monosaturated fats, it helps keep our cholesterol in check and also protect our cells. And protecting our cells in today's environment is very important because we're bombarded with a lot of chemicals and sometimes poor diet, poor sleep habits, so on and so forth. And so when we have monosaturates in our diet, it helps to protect ourselves from damage. Now I could go on and on about the benefits of lard, but one more thing that I want to tell you that's exceptionally interesting to those of us who are traditional home cooks. Lard makes a wonderfully flaky pie crust. And since it's a healthy fat, it's much better for us to use to make a pie crust than those solid vegetable shortenings that are sold in the can. Solid vegetable shortenings go through a process of hydrogenation to make them solid and it's very much considered a damaged fat by those of us who are traditional home cooks. So if you're on your journey moving from a processed foods kitchen to a traditional foods kitchen, substituting lard in place of that solid vegetable shortening is probably one of the best things you can do for making your pie crust as well as other baked goods. And a little tip I'll share with you if you're concerned that if you use lard to make your pie crust you won't have that wonderful buttery flavor that's also very delightful in a pie crust. You can use half lard and half butter and I'm telling you you're going to get the most perfect pie crust. Alrighty well let's get to making our lard. Now I just want to say you don't need to write any of these instructions down because if you open the description underneath this video you'll see a link that'll say recipe 
and that'll take you over to my website, Mary's Nest, same name as my YouTube channel, and you can read the recipe online or you can print it out. Now, as I mentioned previously, I'm going to render five pounds of pork fat. And pork fat comes in two varieties. There's the pork fat that is the traditional one that's just called lard. And that's generally pork fat that comes off of the back of the pig. Lard is wonderful and it has somewhat of a pork flavor and aroma to it. Not unlike bacon grease, but just slightly milder. However, there's another type of pork fat and it's called leaf fat, L-E-A-F, leaf pork fat. Leaf fat is the fat that surrounds the organs, the internal organs of the pig. And specifically, your best leaf fat is that which comes from around the kidneys of the pig. And it's that leaf fat that's prized by bakers because the leaf fat from around the kidneys is a very pure type of lard and it does not have any aroma or taste of pork. So when you're searching to buy your pork fat, think about what you might be using it for. And if you're going to be using it in savory dishes and you're comfortable with it having a bit of a pork fat, a pork flavor or pork aroma, the back fat will be fine. But if you want something that's very mild and doesn't have any pork flavor or pork aroma, then look for leaf fat. Now, can just regular pork fat be used in baking? Yes, but it tends to work better in those baked goods that have stronger flavors, like chocolate or cinnamon. You can even use it to make biscuits with because biscuits often have a bit of a savory flavor. But for your more delicate baked goods, and I would even include pie crusts in this, I would recommend using some type of leaf lard. But that's specifically for your sweet pies. If you're making a quiche or a savory pie crust, then by all means, your regular lard will work great. This is specifically leaf pork fat because I'm going to make leaf lard. But regardless of what type of pork fat you're using, the process is the same. Now what I've got here is about five pounds of leaf fat. And this has been run through a meat grinder for me, so it makes this job very easy. So if you're buying pork fat, whether it's the back fat or the leaf fat, ask the butcher if they can run it through the meat grinder for you. If not, no problem. If you just have the solid piece of fat, all you need to do is cut it up into chunks, about one inch in size. I don't really feel it's necessary to mince it or run it through a food processor. You can certainly do that, but I almost think it's like a little bit of extra work that doesn't make a big difference when you go to actually render the fat. Now all I'm going to do is transfer all of this fat to my colander. Now there are two very important tips when it comes to rendering animal fat the right way. Now I shared these tips in the video where I showed you how to make tallow and I want to repeat them here as we make lard. You do not need to put any water into the bottom of your stock pot and you don't need to put any water into your Dutch oven along with your fat. The reason you may see people add water either to a stock pot into which the fat is going to drip or right into their Dutch oven along with their fat is because water is used to prevent burning. However, if your fat is burning or the cracklings are burning, your temperature is too high. So the secret to correctly rendering animal fat the right way is to make sure you keep your temperature low. This is a, what do they say, low and slow or slow and low process. If you are putting your fat directly into a Dutch oven and then into your oven, you do not want it to be any higher than 225 degrees Fahrenheit. Now in using this method where we're going to put our colander over our stock pot, we're actually going to start our oven out even lower. We're going to set our oven to 200 degrees Fahrenheit. 
Then after about an hour, we're going to check to see how our fat is rendering and assuming at that point there is some fat that's down into our stock pot, we can then turn our temperature up to 225 degrees Fahrenheit and continue to let our fat render and drip down into our stock pot. So don't add any water, but always remember to keep your oven temperature low. And there's a very important reason that I want to share with you as to why you really want to avoid ever adding any water to rendering fat. And it doesn't matter whether you're rendering pork fat or suet, beef fat. When you render fat, you want to make sure that what you primarily have is fat. And it can be very difficult for the home cook to make sure that he or she gets all of the water that you've added during the process to make it's very difficult to make sure that you get all of that water separated from your fat. Yes, you can strain it and then once it's cooled, you can separate the fat from the water and maybe scrape some off the top. You know, if you've ever done this with a bone broth, you may uh, be able to visualize what I'm talking about where you're scraping the bone broth off the fat that's congealed on the top. The only problem is home cooks do not have the equipment that allows us to really get out every last bit of water the way this can be done in a factory through centrifugal force and so on and so forth. So that's really another reason why you don't want to add water. When you have just fat with no little bits of droplets of water anywhere to be seen, you will have a very good life, a very good shelf life to your lard. Now, when I say shelf life, yes, lard should be refrigerated and not put into a pantry the way tallow can be, because as we discussed in the beginning, lard is very rich in monosaturates, and it's the more saturated fat that allows a fat to be more shelf stable at room temperature, like tallow, which is a very saturated fat. But making sure that there's no water in your lard will extend its life even in the refrigerator. And another thing about not adding any water and doing this process on a very low temperature allows any water that may be naturally occurring in your fat to evaporate because we do have those cracklings, the little bits and bobs of little bits of meat, little bits of blood, whatever the case may be, that do contain some liquid, that do contain some moisture. But rendering this at a very low temperature, not adding any extra water, allows any liquid moisture water that may be in this fat to evaporate. So our final product is really rendered the right way, as close as we can get to how this would be done in a factory, that you really have 100% lard with no moisture in it. Now we'll go ahead and put this into our oven at 200 degrees Fahrenheit. I think that's about 93 degrees Celsius, but I think you could probably do 90 degrees Celsius. And then after about an hour, we're going to check it and we'll see that some fat is rendering down into there so we no longer just have a bare pot that could potentially burn. So we've got some fat rendering down in there and then we can move the temperature up to 225 degrees Fahrenheit and this will probably take somewhere around six or more hours to render. Well, this was in the oven for about six hours. I checked it after that first hour and things were starting to come along nicely and I had a little fat already rendered down into my soup pot. So I turned the heat up to 225 degrees Fahrenheit and then let it go another five or so hours. And now I have these wonderful cracklins here in my uh, strainer. Now what I like to do with these cracklins is just transfer them to a, a paper uh, paper towel. You have to think about for a minute. Paper towel lined plate, and I'm just going to let them cool. And they're already pretty crispy, but as they cool, they'll become even crispier. Some people really like to enjoy these as a treat, 
and other people like to save them for maybe a treat for their dogs. So I'll just transfer, you can hear, you can kind of hear the little, the crispiness to them as I transfer them over here. But I'll just get these onto my paper, my paper towel lined plate, and I'm gonna let those cool, and then I'm gonna show you how beautiful our lard looks. Now for the next step, you have a couple of options. Overall, your rendered lard is going to look very clear using this method with a mesh strainer or a colander. Now, there may be like a few little bits that have slipped through uh, whatever type of colander or strainer you used, and so you'll want to remove those. If they're very minor, you can even just take maybe a little spoon or a slotted spoon and remove them that way. Alternatively, you can go ahead and strain your rendered lard through a mesh strainer. Now, this is where you have some options. Some people like to line their mesh strainer with some cheesecloth or a flour sack towel. And you know I use a lot of flour sack towels uh, when I strain my bone broth. But I really don't like to do that when I'm straining rendered fat. And the reason is you don't want to wet your cheesecloth or your flour sack towel because you don't want to start introducing any moisture to your fat. However, pouring the warm or hot rendered fat through the cheesecloth or the flour sack towel creates a situation where the towel or the cheesecloth absorb a lot of the fat and you lose some of your lard or tallow, whatever you're making. Instead, what I like to do is to simply take my lard and strain it through a plain mesh strainer, but one that has a very tight weave to it. This has, this is extremely tight. If you have a uh, French chinois, that works really well also. So what I'm gonna do is take this and very carefully start to pour it through my mesh strainer. Now I poured this out very carefully and very gently. And as you'll see, this is all that was in my lard. And it really was just kind of floating on top. I may have been even able to just remove it uh, with a little spoon, but filtering it out this way, I feel, okay, I've gotten every little last bit of uh, crackling. So I really like this method because I don't have to worry about scooping all of the cracklings out of my melted rendered fat, whether it's tallow or uh, pork fat. It's nice that I've got them all contained in, in the colander or mesh strainer, whatever you use, and then you can pour it you know, through a very tight mesh strainer like this, and as you see, this looks beautifully, you know, for lack of a better word, clarified. <laughs> now I just want to show you, I poured this very slowly and you'll see that I did leave behind some little bits and bobs that will float to the bottom. And then when you pour your fat into your bowl to get ready to decant it, you can basically do it very slowly so that all those little bits and bobs that uh, uh, sunk to the bottom when the fat was rendering uh, won't go into your final product. I just was really watching and when they started to come to the, uh, to the end of the pot, I said, okay, that's it. Now what I like to do is decant my lard, in this case, my nice leaf lard, into quart-sized jars. And the reason that I like to put this in quart-sized jars is that lard does best in terms of extending its shelf life if you refrigerate it. Yes, some sources say that you can store lard at room temperature for maybe four to six months, and you have to make sure that you've processed this very well and that there's no water in it and that you keep it in an airtight container, preferably away from heat and light. However, 
I really feel that it's best to keep lard in the refrigerator. Now, if I called this a quart, I meant to say pint. So, <laughs> except my correction. But in any event, what I wanted to say was I like to go one step further. I like to take one pint and keep that in my refrigerator for my use. Then, if I have extra, I like to put that in pint jars that I then store in my freezer. Because in my refrigerator, my lard can stay fresh for a year, but in my freezer, it can stay fresh for two years. So once I use up my one pint in my refrigerator, then I'll pull a pint out from my freezer, transfer that to my refrigerator, and sort of start the whole cycle over again. So what I like to do is just warm my jars so they're not getting too much of a shock of this hot rendered fat. And then I'll clean it up, I'll put a lid on it. Well, actually I'll clean it up and then I'll let it cool just to about room temperature and then I'll put the lid on and refrigerate it. Now when I decant my lard into my jars, I like to leave about an inch or so headspace. So as it chills in the refrigerator or especially in the freezer and expands, I don't have to worry about my jar breaking. And for my refrigerator for this first batch, I'm definitely gonna use a canning jar and just a storage lid and that's gonna go right into my refrigerator. For my freezer, I really like using these French, sometimes they're called French working glasses or French jelly jars. I have them in multiple sizes. If you've seen a lot of my bone broth videos, you know I like to decant my bone broth in here because I like to put a lot of bone broth in my freezer. And these are great because they have a plastic lid that, and these are very strong, very heavy glasses. And what's nice about these is that I'll fill them just up to this point here. So, you know, it's giving it about an inch or so headspace. And then I'll put these plastic lids on. Now, I generally never overfill my jars, so I generally don't have any problem with breakage. But if by chance it really expanded in here uh, for whatever reason, all that happens, it just will pop off the lid. So it's, I find it to be very safe. So this is something I, I highly recommend. I find these a lot of times in uh, thrift stores, like Goodwill and places like that. So these are definitely uh, well worth it. They're very good for freezing uh, liquids or fats. Now as this cools, it's going to get lighter and lighter in color. And once refrigerated, it'll almost appear white. Now all you need to do is let this come to room temperature and you'll notice that it'll start to become solid and it'll start to lighten in color. Then you can go ahead, put your lid on, pop it in your refrigerator or your freezer, depending on how you're planning on storing it. Remember, it'll have a shelf life of one year in your refrigerator, two years in your freezer. And once it's refrigerated or frozen, it'll become more and more solid and it'll become lighter and lighter in color. And that's exactly what you're looking for. Now, if you'd like to learn more about fat and how to render animal fat, including chicken fat to make schmaltz and suet or beef fat to make tallow, be sure to click on this video over here where I have a playlist all about these fats and how to use them. And I'll see you over there in my Texas Hill Country kitchen. Love and God bless.